Okay, so we are now in the book of Zechariah. And the book of Zechariah, it's an interesting book because it's essentially the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. We can call it the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? So it's going to present the Messiah as the savior of Israel. And it's also going to show them about being a king who is betrayed, right? Because that's what we're going to find in this book of Zechariah. It's a great book with all kinds of references to both the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. So you're going to talk about the day of the Lord, and then you're going to talk about the remnant of Israel and their transition from being a faithless Messiah rejecting people to turning to their Savior and saying, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And all of history changes at that point, because that's really what all of history is waiting for, for the acceptance of the Jewish people of their Messiah. Remember what Jesus said way back when he says, if you would, John the Baptist could have been your Elijah, if you would just have accepted, but you would not. So I'm leaving. I'm leaving till you're ready to accept. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but that's essentially what happens, right? So he's going to speak about, you know, the situation of Jerusalem, where it's going to be occupied by the Gentiles and ultimately will be delivered by their king. So Zechariah, he existed. So when did Zechariah, he came in after the captivity of Judah. So remember, just as a brief history recap, you had the northern kingdom of Israel, which was destroyed by the Assyrians and then was scattered amongst all of the nations. They were intermarried and intermixed with Babylonians and Egyptians and um, Syrians, and they became what we call the Samaritans, right? And that's what happened to the kingdom of Israel. And because they became this intermixed breed, those who were still pure-blooded Jews, which very much so tried to keep within their tribes, they began to look down on the Samaritans. They didn't like the Samaritans. They were the bad guys or the half-breeds. But we also find it interestingly how Jesus looks upon that kind of racism that he says, no, guess who the hero of my stories are? It's always the good Samaritan. He goes to the Samaritan woman, right? He doesn't look on him like the rest of the world does. But the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, which again represents all 12 tribes. The Bible makes it clear that everyone who wanted to worship God from all 12 tribes, when the nation of Israel split, those who wanted to worship God all moved to Judah. Those who rejected God all moved away. But even though they wanted to worship God, we know that as time went on, they became more and more faithless and ultimately rejected the teachings of the Bible, the teachings of Moses, and also the warnings of the prophets, right? So here we are, and we have this guy named Zechariah, and he was born in Babylon and now comes back with this remnant to live in Jerusalem. So he lived during the same time of Haggai and Zerubbabel. Whenever we talked about Haggai, he was the prophet from just a couple months earlier. And he spoke to Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Jerusalem. He was the governor of Israel at the time. Now, why wasn't he the king of Israel? Does anyone remember? So the last king of Israel, he was cursed by God that no one of his genetic line could ever reign as king again, right? And that was a real problem for the line of Solomon. That was a real issue. Somewhere, some way, the next king would have to be adopted by the line of Solomon. And it turns out there was a guy named Joseph, and he happened to adopt the next king, as we all know, the Christmas story, as we call it, right? So anyways... There are more prophecies about Jesus in this book than in all the other minor prophets combined. So this book is like dedicated to reveal Jesus Christ as he is coming. Now, by the way, this is more a tradition thing. They talk about a Zechariah who's killed between the temple and the altar. Some people assume and think maybe correctly that this was the Zechariah that was killed between the temple and the altar. But we're not really sure. We don't No one really knows for sure. So historically, Jerusalem had fallen to Nebuchadnezzar back in 586 BC and had taken the people of Israel for 70 years back into Babylon for the captivity, the people of the kingdom of Judah. But Jeremiah said that that was going to happen in Jeremiah 25, 11 and 29, 10. And Daniel, during his exile, he knew 
based on the prophecies of Jeremiah, when all this was going to come to an end. And that's whenever he starts praying in the book of Daniel. And he's waiting for Jesus to come or for God to come and restore them back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. So while he is there, he has a vision. And in that vision, a concept is revealed to him called the time of the Gentiles. And the time of the Gentiles happened from the time Jerusalem was conquered and will remain until Jesus returns as king. That's when the Gentiles are in power, not Israel. They're in power over Israel. And again, look historically, all throughout history, Jerusalem has gone back and forth and back and forth in control of all these different people. And even today, they're constantly in fear for their lives because all of these nations want to see Israel destroyed. Many nations. And they get support from some nations and are against by some nations, but always under the power of the Gentiles. But there's going to be a time coming where they're going to be ruled by a king who is the world power. And that king will be Jewish through and through. He'll be half from the tribe of Judah and half from the tribe of Levi. Right? So he is, he is fully God and fully man. But the point is, we know that Mary, her cousins, were both full-blooded Levites. Right? She says, go to my cousin Mary. And she was with the daughters of Levi. And her husband was of the sons of Levi. Right. So we know Jesus was both king and priest, had a line of both. Right. Um, so anyways, during this time, while they're gone, that's the time when the Gentiles are ruling. And Daniel's told during that time, the Messiah will come and will be cut off, but not for himself or cut off. If you, you know, look at the Hebrew word, he's going to be cut off. And of course, what happened during the reign of the Gentiles under the Roman Empire? Well, that's when Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. So after the occupation of Jerusalem by the Babylonian people, whenever they ruled over it, and after the captivity of Israel, 70 years later, the Persians came to power. Remember the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar died, his grandson took the throne, his grandson was a total jerk, had a drunken sex party, and then while he's there, he's like, you know what, let's go and defile all of the utensils and all of the bowls and the cups from the temple of Jerusalem, bring it out so we can party with it. He's ready to go ahead and just perform sacrilegious things with God's uh, uh, dinnerware, I guess you could think of it, from the temple. And what happens? He sees the writing on the wall. And literally the hand shows up out of nowhere, writes on the wall. And then that night the Persians come in, kill him, take over. So the Persians take over. And now we have Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great coming in as the first major king. And he says, listen, you guys, God has told me to let all of the Jewish people who want to go, to go home, because God has given me this goal of seeing the temple rebuilt. I want to see the temple of God rebuilt. And here is even a donation. Get on your way. And when you rebuild the temple, of course, we know that they'll eventually reinstate the sacrifices. And they'll reinstate all of the feasts of Israel. And there are the feasts of God, I should say, because there are a handful of feasts of God, which are also in addition to some of the feasts of Israel. And we can talk about those at another time. So for 70 years, for 70 years, the people of Israel were heartbroken. They have no nation of their own. They saw what happened to the kingdom of Israel and these, these, uh, the kingdom of Judah, these remaining Israelites. They're looking around and they're like, man, God must have abandoned us. We must have been forgotten here, right? And that's kind of the situation. But some of them, like Daniel, they believed the word of God. And by the way, Daniel took the word of God literally. He didn't take the 70 years to mean some figurative number. He didn't say, well, well maybe 70 years means seven weeks. Or No, he says 70 years. Okay, we're at 69, about that time. And he starts praying. And guess what? He was right, right? He took the Bible seriously. So he realized that the promises of God were sure, and he believed what God had to say. So the people now, they're allowed to return. They all come back. And as we mentioned earlier, they are rebuilding this. They start to rebuild the temple. They're rebuilding the walls. Nehemiah is working on repairing all the walls. Ezra comes by and says, okay, let's rebuild this temple. But 
people start to oppress them. All these people start standing against them. Nothing is going the way they want. And even whenever they are ready to build, they can't build it to the glory of the previous temple of Solomon. They can't make it look as good. So everything seems bad. They weren't producing the results they wanted. So that's where Haggai had come in on the scene. And he says, what do you guys think you're doing? They gave up on the job and for 15 years sat around and started building their own houses, planting their own fields. Haggai's like, what are you guys doing? How dare you leave the temple like it is all because of a little opposition, all because somebody stood in your way. Does that change the work God has given you because it got hard? Give me a break, get to work. And under Zerubbabel, they end up getting to work. Now, Zechariah, he's going to arrive on the scene while they're building the temple. We're two months in whenever he shows up and gives his message. So Zechariah, as I mentioned, he's born in Babylon. He had not got to see the Jerusalem that he had heard about. He never got to see the glory of this magnificent temple that all these old people had seen. He had come back just to see this, these ruins, essentially. He comes back, and all he sees is devastation and desolation. There's nothing there. The walls are falling down. It's miserable. That's what he sees. Nothing's like he envisioned. And you're surrounded by your enemies. The people were discouraged. They had lost heart. There was no king, no army, no walls, nothing. Their homes weren't even coming together. We know from the book of Haggai, they'd go and plant their fields, and they wouldn't get the crops they wanted. They wouldn't even get half as many as they wanted. Everything sucked in a word, right? And frankly, out of their misery, God gives him all these promises. And he says, no, no, I'm going to provide. I know it all sucks. I know you've lost everything, but you haven't lost me, right? And I think there's a lot you can learn from the situation Israel was in, the time in Israel's history. Whenever you look around you and everything sucks, Sometimes you get to that point, right? I'm sure if you're not there now, you've been there where everything sucks. It can be discouraging, but you know, a lot of times we don't see that God is still working. Do you know why we don't see that God is still working? Because sometimes he might be working right in front of us and we're over here staring like this. We just, we're, we're not seeing. So we're going to see him in this book say, hey, turn, turn back to me. If you want me to turn to you, you turn to me. I'm right here working, right? So Zechariah had a message that we all need to listen to. His message is God remembers. He hasn't forgotten about you. He remembers and he will bless, but at the appointed time. He will bless and he's already set the time when that blessing's coming. He will bless. That's the understanding that David had. Psalm 60 verse 1 says, oh God, Thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. Oh, turn thyself to us again. I'm lost, but you will turn. You'll come back. This book shows you God's greatest desire. God's desire is to see healing, to see restoration, to see salvation. He doesn't want the Israelites to stay in pain. He's not still angry with them. He was angry at one point, but he's a God of mercy. He wants to restore them. That's what we're going to see in this book. He has not only the desire to see them restored, but he has the ability to restore them. So again, they had thought oh, God was angry with them. And after all, they were sent to Babylon. Why? To be judged for their wickedness because they refused to give the land a Sabbath for, for 490 years. He said, you owe me 70 years. I meant what I said, and I say what I mean. So he said, you got to do, you got to give me what's owed me. But now their judgment's done. He says, God now is going to talk with them in love and speak mercy to them. Why though? Why, why should he do that? Had they been better than their fathers? Had they been more righteous? Had they done anything better? No, it's because God is a God of mercy and a God who keeps his promises. He wants this people to be an example of his love and mercy. He wants to draw all people to it. So Zechariah tells us all kinds of things, and we're going to learn a lot about Jesus from this book. And that's going to bring us to Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. So Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1, this is the call where we see the return to the Lord. He says, just return here. In verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo the prophet, saying, I'm going to pause right there before I even get to what he says. 
So the entire summary of the book of Zechariah was given in that first verse, right? He says, first of all, we already mentioned there's no king in Israel. So he doesn't date it by the king of Israel. If you look back at the prophets before, they said, oh, in the reign of this king, during the reign of Jeconiah, during the reign of Jehoiakim, here we know we date it by a Gentile king because there is no king in Israel. But the summary we see here is in the names. Zechariah means what? God remembers. Yahweh remembers. Berechiah, Yahweh blesses. Edo, at the appointed time. The Arabic word for, for to remember is zakar, zakart, right? Zechariah. So he says, God remembers and God blesses at the appointed time. Now we know from Ezekiel that Zechariah, not only was he a prophet, but he was also a priest, right? He was a priest because we know that Edo was one of the priests. And that's from Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 4. So we mentioned this a few minutes ago, but he talks about in the eighth month and the second year of Darius, that means that we're two months after Haggai started preaching. So this is during that initial effort to rebuild the temple. So he's preaching his message at the same time that Haggai is telling his message to get back to work on the temple. And Haggai is working with them to build the temple. But you notice they have two very different messages. And if anyone has been reading the book of Zechariah, they're going to notice the book of Zechariah is quite a bit longer than the book of Haggai, right? I don't know if this is, a, I don't mean it to be um, disrespectful in any way, but if you ever see like one of those cartoons where somebody says, you know, give me the list of rules, and then they pull out the rules and like the paper falls to the ground because it's so long, you know what I'm talking about? You know, I feel like, hey guy, he's like, oh yeah, I got my scroll, let me give you my message. And Zechariah's like, like, I've got mine too, and then boom, the edge of the scroll just rolls down the floor because it's such a long, such a long scroll. But the point is, each one of them was given a message from God. They weren't to try to emulate one another. They weren't trying to compare, compete or compare. God gave each a message, and each one of them did what was asked of them and gave the message that was asked of them. I think it's really unfortunate. Some Christians, they look at other Christians and maybe at other Christians' ministry, and they say, I want to do what they're doing. Oh, you did a play? I want to put on a play. You teach, I want to teach. You preach, I want to preach. You go and do street preaching, I want to go and do street preaching, right? Well, that's fine if that's what God's called you to do. Nothing wrong with that. And sometimes God has called you to uplift a certain ministry. That's fine. But if he does it, it's no less glorious, right? It doesn't matter who's preaching on the pulpit on Sunday morning and who's vacuuming the entryway rug. There's no difference there. The point is, what has God put before you? And what has he asked you to do? It may not be as glorious as the next guy, but in God's eyes, it's the, it's the heart. You know, nobody wanted to wash the feet. So who did it? Jesus Christ, right? He says, look at me as your example. Measure yourself by what God's gifts are to you. If he gave you a gift, use it. If your gift's singing, use it. If your gift's praying, use it, right? The guy who, remember, guy who had the two coins, he was rewarded for putting those two coins to work and making 10 coins. He didn't try to earn, or sorry, earning two coins. He didn't try to earn 10 coins like the guy that was given 10 coins. Sometimes he gives more, but you're supposed to, what are you doing with what you've been given is the real question. So even though, remember, Zerubbabel, he's the governor of Judah, but again, we're dated by a Gentile king because of that curse that had fallen on Jeconiah, and he was to be written childless. And again, this is another proof that we are currently, at this point in history, in the time of the Gentiles. In Hosea chapter 3, verse 4, talked about that. It says, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, and without teraphim. But afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So the setting here is that the people are miserable. They had no temple. Their cities are laid waste. And only recently had Haggai said, all right, get to work. So they've chopped the wood. They've gotten the gold. They've gotten everything. And they're ready to work. And we're going to see these promises that they have because they didn't have the resources they needed. But God told them, I have the resources. Remember in the last book of Haggai, the silver is mine. The gold is mine. I have what you need. Just get to work. So Zechariah 1, 2. Here's the message God had. 
verse one, two through one, six. He says, the Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore, say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Turn you now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. So God remembers. Here's the first part of the message. God remembers. He remembered the people when they were in exile in Babylon. He remembered what got them there. He remembered he, he was angry with them. For why? Because their constant rejection of him. He would send prophet after prophet after prophet saying, guys, turn from your wicked ways. Let me restore you. And they would keep saying, no, 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 we're going to do it our way. So he's angry with them for this rejection of his love. And they refused to repent. They were ungrateful. We are easy to criticize anytime things don't go our way. We're easy to turn around and say, oh my goodness, can you believe we were talking to dinner? The government's going to take away my right to do A, B, C, and D. But we also forget, you know, how much blessing we have from living in this country, how much we enjoy, how many good things. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm super pro everything the government does, but there are many things we enjoy that many nations in the world do not enjoy. We need to learn to be grateful for the things we have. And we need to show gratefulness, especially to God, for what he's given us and the opportunities we have. Instead of complaining that, man, this pastor goes on and on, and I just want to get home and watch the game. Well, how about thank God that you can meet and not be at risk for your life, right? Because I'm talking about you, Leonard. That's what everybody told me. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just, but no, it's, we, we forget to be grateful to God, right? And that was the problem that, Israel had, that Judah had. And, you know, we, God's wanting them to remember the situation they were in before they went to Babylon. But the people, they said, you know, God's moved away from us. He's forgotten us over here in Babylon. I am in a terrible situation in my life. God and me were miles apart. You ever feel like that? Like you're miles apart from God? I mean, you know, he's there, but I'm just, we're not even in the same ballpark here, right? And, you know, my daughter, when she was younger, I'd come home and I'd sit on the couch and immediately she'd run over, plop on the couch right next to me as my oldest daughter. And she would just, you know, lay up against me and she'd sit there. As long as I sat there, she'd sit there and she'd cuddle and it was very sweet. But over the years, you know, those times became shorter and shorter and shorter. And there was other things to do and people to play with. Um, and now when I walk in the house, I get a quick hug. Hey, dad, you know, love you. And then goes right about her business. And Lately, you know, I've been trying to spend a little more time with the kids one on one. So me and her went out to dinner and to the uh, the place where you do the rock climbing up there at the Highlands. And, you know, we had a great time. And as we were driving back, she was just like, you know, I really don't want our time to be over. I really don't want, you know, to go back. I love, you know, would we just hang out like we used to remember when I used to come and sit beside you and we would just sit there. And I said, you know, I still come home. And I still sit on the same couch. You know, what's the difference? I'm still, if you come sit beside me, I'll still be there. The difference is where have you gone, right? I'm the same dad and I'm a flawed human. How much more is God? He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still there. And he's, if you're a Christian, he's still there in your heart, right? And we feel distant from God, but he's not distant from us. We have turned our backs to him. We just literally turned around, right? And he's just waiting for us to turn back around. Turn to me and I'll turn to you. No matter how far you've walked or drifted or even and just ran away from God in anger, in fear, in sadness, in depression, in whatever you were in, no matter how far, how many miles away you are, he's right behind you. There's an old secular song that says, wherever you go, I'll be two steps behind. And that's the thing. You can't get away from God. Actually, the psalmist tried to say, well, I go to heaven. You're there. If I go to the depths of hell, you're there. No matter where I go, the depths of the sea, you are there. People, and again, I love this quote, and I think I got it from Chuck Missler. Um, 
somebody said, you know, is God really watching me all the time? Like really everything I do, is he watching you? And the answer was, honey, he loves you so much. He can't take his eyes off of you. He's always right there. Praise God. So we hear here that he says that he's the Lord of hosts. We're all in trouble. <laughs> he's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts means he's the Lord of the armies of heaven. He is the all powerful, right? He can do anything. He's the creator. And he's spoken to their fathers. And he said, do whatever you can. Let me come and show mercy on you. Just turn to me. He begged their fathers. Do what you can. And he's telling these people, this remnant from Babylon, he's like, guys, don't follow the same path your fathers did. Do things the right way. Turn to me. Turn away. What is the word to turn away? What's another word we use for that? To turn from something? Repent, right? For the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. He's calling, he called them to repent, and he's calling for us to repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn to who? To God. How can I turn to God? Only through Jesus Christ. We can approach the throne boldly through the blood of Christ. So God points out to them how brief human life is. He said, look at your fathers. Where are they at now? Where are the prophets? Everyone dies. Every opportunity wasted is gone. Each day is gone. Monday is gone. You will never have yesterday again. It's over. Seize the moments that you have. The fathers of Israel, they did not respond to God. And they came to, the, they came to their own, their, they created their own exile by going to Babylon, by refusing to respond to God. But God didn't forget about them. He didn't want them to stay there a day longer than was needed. As soon as the 70 days was up, okay, now's the time. Get back. You guys are now able to come back. He doesn't want the same thing to happen again. And again, if you have done something or your family or whatever has done something, no matter what you've done, God wants you to come back. No matter how far you've gone, he wants you to come back. Our God wants to do things not because you can do them. He wants to work for you, and he wants to work through you. He wants the people of Israel to be his people, to shine his light to the world. He put each one of you, and he put me together in our mother's womb. He stitched us together. Our parents put, came together to give us a body, but God himself created our soul. He created our spirit within us. And not only that, not only does he know us even from the deepest part physically, he knows our hearts, he knows our mind, he knows our deepest, darkest sin, and he still wants you. And that's mind-blowing. He took all your sins, which should have separated you from him forever. And what did he do? He says, I'll take those. Give them here. He put them on himself. He blotted out your transgressions like a cloud. He says, return to him. That's Isaiah 44, 22. So now he's telling these people, they were going to remember, hey, guy was working on rebuilding the temple. He says, you got to rebuild the temple. But Zechariah is saying, no, rebuild your relationship too. Rebuild your love between you and God, your relationship to God. He was sore displeased is how it said. Sore displeased with the fathers, with their sin. But he's no longer angry with the sinner. How can you be so angry with the sin, but no longer angry with the sinner? Well, that's because of the same reason that Moses was supposed to strike the rock the first time. But the second time he was supposed to speak to it. You remember that story, right? Why did he strike the rock? Well, Jesus says, I'm going to go and stand on the rock and then come and strike the rock. He's, I will sit on the rock before you and you come and strike it. So who's Moses striking? Jesus. Why? So how come he can no longer be angry with the sinner? Because someone else has carried the sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, it says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. Whose righteousness do we get? Jesus Christ's. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The word propitiation. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, 
to make reconciliation or propitiation for the sins of the people. First John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation from, for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's because we've been propitiated for. What, what does that word mean? Anybody know what that word means? To be a propitiation? <laughs> What's that? Like a shield. The word propitiation specifically means appeasing the wrath of a deity. Think about what that means. God's extraordinary anger and hatred of sin needed a propitiation, literally a shield, something to take the beating that was coming, <coughs> something to be ripped to shreds, to their back be ripped open like a plowed field, to take that beard and literally rip it out of their face, to slam holes through the hands and the feet, to shove a crown of thorns into the head and to let the whole world spit on and ridicule and mock and laugh at and so they could die alone. All for what? You and for me to propitiate. That's what I deserved. That's what you deserve, whether you're willing to admit it or not. But God now speaks to us. Had Moses done it right, he'd have struck it the first time. But he said, no, once it's paid for, he's no longer angry with the sinner. Just speak, speak to God. And that's what he's telling him. He's like, no, I'm no longer angry with you, Israel, but you need to restore that relationship because now that he's no longer angry with me, it's up to me to build that relationship. He says, come on, I'll talk. I'll actually dwell with you. Just come and have that relationship with me. So that was his first, that was Zechariah's first message to Israel. So now we're going to move on to his next, next message, verse seven. He says, upon the four and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, so now we are, so now we are five months away. We're five months out from that original building of the temple. Zechariah's prophecy, the first prophecy was about three months ago. So the judgment that was going to show up for the whole world, he's actually going to talk in a few minutes about a judgment where he's angry with the entire world. That this is the calm before the storm. That's what this vision is going to be about. And every time you see a vision in the Bible, understand that none of it is falling to waste. Everything in the vision will come to pass. Whenever a vision is told, there's a couple exceptions where the priests or the prophets are like, please wait, don't make that happen. He's like, okay, I won't make that happen. But in general, whenever you see a vision, it is going to come to pass. There are hundreds in the Bible. Remember back in whenever Abraham sees a vision, right? And God comes and tells him that, that your people are going to be like the stars of the sky and things like that. Well, it all comes to pass. But here we have a vision that's going to show us what's happening in the spiritual world. Because there is a whole world around us that is spiritual. So verse 8 says, I saw by night. And behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were, were there red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O Lord, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. So Zechariah, he saw a man riding this red horse, and he has a bunch of other horsemen with him, riding red, speckled, and white horses. So where was he standing? In the myrtle trees. And we find in verse 11, we'll find out in a few minutes, the man riding the original red horse, he is called the angel of the Lord. So angel means messenger. But whenever you look throughout the Old Testament, whenever you see a reference to the angel of the Lord, it very often appears to be Jesus Christ. Before he is made flesh, he shows up as the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God. So he was the angel of the Lord in Exodus 23, verses 20 to 21. It said, God's name is in this angel. So that angel was God's name that went before the children of Israel as they traveled uh, across the desert. He's identified with God in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13, and in 22, verse 11 and 12. Also in Judges chapter 6, verse 11, whenever we hear about Samson and those stories, and a lot of other places, you're going to see him wrestling with men, like wrestling with Jacob. It's always the angel of the Lord, and they always call him my Lord, my God, right? 
And we know from the New Testament that any time in the Old Testament that someone encountered God, that it wasn't God the Father. Who was it? It was Jesus Christ. He's the one who met with uh, Hagar at the well of the God who sees me. Beer Lahai Roy, right? He says, God sees me. He's the one who told Abraham, stop. Don't kill the child. And then he drew his attention to the ram whose head was caught in a crown of thorns in the thicket right there, right? Um, he's the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. So Jesus Christ has been with us since the beginning of creation. He shows up throughout history. And then he physically was born in the earth as one of us about 2,000 years ago. So the rider of this horse, he's a warrior. Why? He's on a red horse. What is the red horse? Well, it tells you it's a war horse. And it may be that it was a white horse originally and is now covered in blood. That seems like a really unpleasant scene. Do you know of anyone that does that? Who comes riding a white horse, but then it's covered in blood? Anyone that does that? Who is that? Jesus Christ. Revelation 1911, Isaiah 63. Jesus is going to come riding this white horse, but he's going to trample his enemies. And everybody's going to be like, man, why are you all red? He's like, oh, because I treaded the grapes, the grapes of my wrath. I treaded my enemies down, right? So the people that ride with him, we're going to see in a minute, they're the angels. Or the angels are possibly even the armies of heaven who go to and fro in the earth, inspecting what happens in the world of men. Now, we know from the book of Job that Satan traveled to and fro in the earth, right? We know that angels come and give reports. They're presenting themselves to Jesus whenever they're telling him what they've been up to. And Satan was among those that had to give report. So both angels and fallen angels are patrolling the earth and inspecting how things are going. So the angel of the Lord, the one who speaks, is Jesus. And he's standing in the myrtle trees. Do you guys know what the term for the myrtle trees is? It's called the Hadassah shrub. Anybody know who Hadassah is? Hadassah? Anyone? Esther. Esther. That's her name, right? The Hadassah shrub was actually symbolic of Israel, right? It was symbolic of Israel. So he's standing in the midst of Israel symbolically. And so we see this angel of the Lord followed by these other horses. And Zechariah, he wants to know what's going on here. What's the angel going on? The angel that's with him, not the one standing in the middle of the myrtle shrubs, but the angel who's with him explaining the things says, I'll, let, I'll show you what these are. So verse 10, he says, and the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. In verse 11, it says, and they, answered, and they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth. And behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. So the angel of the Lord here, he tells Zechariah and the angel standing next to him that those on the horses, those riding the horses, they have been inspecting the world and everything is calm. It looks like there is peace throughout the world. Everything is at peace. Do you know there is a guy who's coming on the scene shortly, may already be around, who is going to establish a world peace? And by his peace, he will kill many. Do you know who that guy is? Antichrist. It's the Antichrist, right? So he's saying the earth is at rest. Everything's good. Then the angel in verse 12 says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years, or 70 years? So the angel, the one who is in charge of these horsemen, this angel of the Lord, who again, I'm suggesting is Jesus Christ, he actually asks God in heaven, he's like, how long are we not going to have mercy on Jerusalem and on Israel? When are we going to have mercy on them? So for 70 years, they were in exile. And the angel riding this, he says, how long are we going to wait? You know, it is interesting. It's almost as this angel of the Lord says, it is only the father who knows the day and the time. Do you know anyone else who said that? When he says, it's only the father who knows the day and the time, the appointed time of his return? Jesus said it about God, right? Also, isn't it interesting that this angel of the Lord, his heart is what? To see mercy poured out onto Jerusalem. Do you know, have you ever heard anyone else in the Bible that says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem? 
thou who killed the prophet, how often I would have gathered you like a chick, like a, like a hen gathers her chicks. Somebody whose heart is all about pouring out mercy. Do you see the similarities we see here? This man and Jesus Christ, right? So he's still who he was. He's desperate for the restoration of Israel. He wanted to see Israel restored. He still wants to see Israel restored. All these people who are out there teaching that, oh, no, no, the church has replaced Israel. Crazy talk. Crazy talk. We've been grafted in. Yes. We are now the people of God. Yes. But Israel is still Israel. God has not abandoned or forgotten them. And he still has a work to do with them. Verse 13. It says, and the Lord answered the angel, which that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So God in heaven answers Jesus, what I would argue is Jesus here on earth, that there is a favorable answer, good words and comfortable words. God loves Jerusalem. The angels begging for mercy on Jerusalem. God says, don't worry, you're going to like what I have to say. And he tells them something good and comfortable. So the words that Jesus has, all, the, all of the character of Jesus, his words are good and comforting. For fear not. How many times does he say fear not? When Jesus talks, he says, behold, I am with you. How long? Even to the end of the age. I am with you always. Cast your cares on me. Why? Because I care for you. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. My sheep hear my voice. I am the good shepherd. The words of Christ, what are they? They're good and they're comfortable. Israel might not have felt very loved at this point in their history. They had just come out of captivity. They didn't have anything they wanted. They still didn't have the temple. But even when they were felt lost and forgotten, they were not. Same is true for us today. Sometimes we feel lost. Sometimes we feel forgotten. Sometimes we feel abandoned. We are not. Turn to God. Same story he said. God remembers. Zechariah. Zechariah. God remembers. Instead of looking for answers whenever we don't like what God has to tell us, we sometimes look for what we want to hear. We go to people who are going to tell us the things we already want to believe. But instead, whenever we have these troubles, when we feel alone and abandoned, we should look to the words of God. We should look to the people of God. We should look to prayer. And even though sometimes the things we read are not what we want to hear, they're still good and comforting words. Because why? Everything comes together for good for those who trust the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Yeah. everything that brings us to verse 14 it says so the angel that communed with me said unto me cry thou saying thus saith the lord of hosts i am jealous for jerusalem and for zion with a great jealousy and i am so very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease but i for i was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction so god makes it clear that this isn't just, this isn't meant to be a judgment on Jerusalem. That judgment came and went. He is angry with the entire world. This false peace that has been there, these nations that are at ease, we're like, wait a minute, God doesn't like peace? No, he likes peace. He doesn't like their false peace. He doesn't like their false oppressive peace under this evil world leader. He says, don't mistake your authority over Israel as a license to oppress Israel. God is exceedingly angry. He says, I'm sore displeased extraordinarily angry but he still gives comforting words he is jealous over jerusalem he's so jealous that that's why he's sore displeased he wants to see israel reflect his glory he wants to, to bless them and show his love over them so he does not like the mistreatment of his people he will do whatever is necessary to see them restored if he has to wipe out Every army of every nation united against his people, guess what? He will do it. He will see it done. If he has to take the world dictator, the world power, and wipe him out and take Satan and cast him into a bottomless pit, guess what? He'll do it. He will absolutely do it. He'll do whatever he needs to see Israel restored and forgiven. Even if that means he has to take their blame himself and nail himself to a cross. He'll do it. There is no limit. He will not, there is no length he won't go to. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. What is the reason Jesus came to earth? What is the purpose? What drove him to come to earth? Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God's zeal. He is jealous over this Jerusalem, over this world, this earth, this Israel, this throne. He will rule from it. Even if he has to wipe out everyone to do it, he will. There is a coming kingdom. Again, I know a lot of people will try to argue, no, that's just all figurative. No, there is a coming kingdom where this world will see him rule. And he says the zeal of the Lord, I mean, he was promising it to them from back then. And even after Jesus' ascension, the disciples said, is this the time? Are you going to restore it now? And he's like, no, no, not yet. Not yet. You wait and see. It's for God to know, not for you. For your job is to do what I've told you. God is going to restore it. He, he will perform the task personally. Verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So God is saying here, I will come to Jerusalem. The glory of the Lord has departed, but it will return. In Ezekiel eleven twenty three, 23, it says, And the glory of the Lord went up out from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. How interesting that the glory of the Lord came up and went to the Mount of Olives and left. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if that's ever happened another time in history. Um, we know it's for Jesus, right? And he's coming back. Same spot that he left, right? Um, the temple had fallen, but it was being rebuilt, and it would later be a much greater temple, which we read about later. Haggai was saying to this temple being rebuilt, but there's a temple coming later that's going to be massive, and it'll be described at another time. The borders of Jerusalem will be expanded, and you're going to see a much, much, much larger Jerusalem in the coming days. A massive city. That's uh, How big, what was the dimensions? Do you remember? 50 miles square will be the plateau and the temple will be a mile square. Yeah, I mean, think about the size of this compared to the current Jerusalem, right? So there's going to be a, what it says, a line stretched forth. So if you go out there with your measurement, you're like, okay, now take that line and just keep going. Keep going because it's going to be much bigger. Verse 17 says, cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Okay, again, people will say, no, no, there's no coming, there's no coming millennial reign. No, no, there's no coming time when Jesus is going to roll from the throne. But he's saying, no, no, these cities will have glory. My cities will be glorified. My, I will choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be chosen as the center of the world's attention. God made that choice long ago. And you know, whenever God does something, his calling is irrevocable. It cannot be taken back. He said it, it will happen. Done. He didn't give a list of things. If you notice here, he didn't say, okay, Israel, this is the plan. Now here's the list of what you got to do to get it ready. He didn't say that, right? He didn't say once you do A, B, C, and D, that's when it's going to happen. He didn't tell them how to make all this restoration happen. He just told them it's going to happen. Why? Because it's not them who are going to be doing the restoring. They aren't the ones who make it happen. It's him. Jesus Christ himself will be restoring Jerusalem, will be restoring Israel. He is going to have communion with the people, and he's going to see the temple restored. So it's funny to me when we see how he's worked here in the history, we then say, well, we got to somehow fix ourselves to make ourselves appropriate for God. Um, they were trying to build the temple. They were trying to do their thing. And it's like, yeah, you see that? That's nothing compared to what's coming. God had to make it. So God, like he did with this future coming temple, he also made us new. He restored us all through him. He restored each of us through no work of our own. All we did was receive the gift that he gave us. He didn't give us a list of what he wanted to do, but he prepared us as the temple. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? What made you suitable to be the temple of the Holy Spirit? Go read in Exodus the plans for the tabernacle. And I couldn't even be a good tent. Yet somehow God made me into a temple where he could dwell. That's only by the power of God, not by anything good in me. 
And that's our second vision, our second message from Zechariah. And then we'll get to here the last uh, couple of verses of chapter of chapter one, verse 18. Then I lifted up mine eyes and I saw and beheld four horns. Now horns, biblically, they're talking about powers. Because why? When you look at an animal, what are you worried about? When you see the rhino, you're not worried about his back leg. You're worried about his massive horn, right? You're worried about the antlers. You're worried about the spokes. Things are going to pierce you. So they're the source of the strength, and they're representing the power of the nations. That's lifted up. Whenever a horn is lifted up, a nation is brought up. When the horn is brought down, the nation is brought down. So he said in verse 19, and I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So we don't really have to guess who the horns are. A lot of people want to guess about which nations. Maybe it's the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Well, we know from the book of Daniel that there were yet four kingdoms to scatter and rule over Jerusalem. What's the context of this book? That it's the time of the Gentiles. So the time of the Gentiles, what? We had the Babylonians. Then we had the Persians. Then we're going to have the uh, uh, Greeks then we're going to have the Romans. We are still living today in the time of the Roman Empire. And eventually it's going to be intermixed with the iron and clay, which is what we some people call the revived Roman Empire. We're still in that time. So we're currently living in that time. Verse 20 and 21 says, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So well, again, some people argue about which nation is which, but it doesn't matter. The fact is the whole world's been against Israel at some point in history or will be against Israel at some point in history. The Bible makes it clear that all nations come against Jerusalem. Everyone, right? So who's going to attempt to trample down the nation of Israel? The carpenters. So what are carpenters? Well, these are craftsmen. They invent new ways to oppress God's people, to oppress Israel. So a carpenter, think if you think about it, who would you take to war during this time? Well, you need somebody to make your bows, your arrows, your spears, your machines of war, your chariots to repair the wheels. Who does all that? Who does woodworking? And guess what? It's your carpenter, right? And this made you very skilled and very valuable in war. And the more skilled of a carpenter you are, the more dangerous you are, right? But these carpenters, although they're skilled, they're going to come up against the carpenter, the guy who is far better than they could ever imagine. Because not only can he make the wood whatever he wants it to be, he can just make the wood, right? I mean, this is who they're up against. They don't have any clue what they're up against. And he's going to go forth as in the day of battle. He will see it done. And that brings us to a close of chapter one. Any comments, questions, anything like that?